Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Noshin Chipa, Research Associate at Center of Excellence in Urban Transport, CRDF. Uh, welcome everyone to the fourth Mobilog, Freight Management in Cities. The Mobilog is structured in three parts. The opening session, in which we will have the welcome address, the keynote address, and context setting presentation, followed by the poll questions. Uh, then we'll move to the technical session, in which our esteemed panelists will present on freight specific topics. Uh, the last part of the Mobilog would be the closing session, in which we will take the questions from the participants, followed by the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. Uh, all the participants can send in the questions in the chat box. Uh, now I would request Dr. Shalini Sina, Ex Executive Director at the Center of Excellence in Urban Transport, CRDF, to initiate the Mobilog and deliver the welcome address. Over to you, Dr. Sina. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yashin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to uh, all our panelist uh, speakers, as well as uh, all the participants. Uh, welcome to the fourth Mobilog, which is on freight management in cities. Uh, this Mobilog is a part of the Smart SUT Mobilog series and a part of the National Capacity Building Program organized by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, jointly supported by GIZ India and CRDF SEPT University. Planning for efficient freight management has uh, garnered significant attention over the past few years. And we all know that uh, efficient freight management leads to efficient cities. However, uh, freight also generates many externalities like congestion, air pollution, noise, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, as part of this Mobilog today, uh, we would be focusing on key issues uh, in urban freight management, rise of e-commerce, and how it is shaping urban freight and practices that could enable efficient and sustainable urban uh, freight management in cities. I'm delighted uh, to welcome Mr. Vikas Chaube, Officer on Special Duty, ex officio Joint Secretary, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, who has kindly agreed to be here uh, to deliver the keynote address. Uh, Mr. Vikas Chaube belongs to 1996 batch of Indian Railway Traffic Service. He has done his B.Tech from IIT Roorkee and M.Tech from IIT Delhi. He has served as the Chief Freight Transportation Manager of Northern Railway and uh, has been associated in various capacities in the Ministry of Railways and its divisions. Uh, he is now with Ministry of Commerce and is closely associated with the development of the National Logistics Policy, Digital Transformation in Logistics, the Logistics of Bulk, and break commodities. I would also like to welcome our distinguished panelists, uh, Professor Sanjay Gupta from SBA Delhi, uh, Ms. Saroj Ayush from the World Bank, and Mr. Zhuang Ling from GIZ China. Our moderators uh, today uh, are uh, Mr. Gordon Telling, technical expert, Green Freight GIZ, and Ms. Avni Mehta, junior technical expert, Green Freight GIZ India. I welcome them as well. Now, may I request uh, Mr. Vikas Chaube to kindly deliver the keynote address. Sir, over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Shalini ji. Uh, and uh, a very uh, good afternoon to all the co-panelists. Uh, uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, Saroj, nice to see you. Um, Mr. Ling, uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, Gordon, Avni, um, and of course, uh, Dr. Shalini. So uh, uh, excellent to be sharing the screen and uh, you know and uh, the space with uh, all of these uh, you know exceptionally um, uh, people with exceptional accomplishments in this direction. Um, I must thank uh, you know SEPT uh, Research and Development uh, Foundation for uh, choosing this particular topic of uh, you know freight smart cities and uh, the particular accent on. Uh, you know, rise of e-commerce because uh, this is an area on which uh, the logistics division has been uh, focusing its attention, and uh, we do believe that uh, this particular area uh, requires, uh, you know, not only not only more investment, but I think before uh, uh, any investment goes into this area, it requires uh, the development of a shared understanding of, uh, you know, what are the problems uh, and uh, what are the challenges, uh, you know, in dealing with the, those problems. So. So I think a webinar such as this, uh, this one would uh, go a long way. Um, the logistics division itself held a, uh, a very detailed, extensive meeting uh, in which uh, you know uh, many of you were there. 
uh, where we had discussions with the state governments and uh, the uh, professional institutions and uh, you know various stakeholders and giz uh, i must uh, you know uh, acknowledge the role played by giz as well as by uh, the uh, the ministry of uh, housing and urban affairs and uh, various institutions in uh, you know coming together along with us in uh, organizing that particular um, that particular event uh, on 2nd of uh, july uh, in which i think uh, you know we took several steps forward uh, in terms of uh, graduating from uh, uh, believing uh, in a common way in a shared way that uh, something needs to be done to actually figuring out you know what are those things that need to be done and uh, how we should uh, be moving forward uh, coming to the uh, you know i think um, shalini ji has uh, given an outline of uh, you know what the situation is and you know why the need for freight smart cities i will just touch that very briefly uh, you know uh, i think we are all aware the issues of uh, congestion pollution noise parking problems all of the um, so called mess that we see in our cities uh, is is on account of the fact that uh, perhaps uh, all along our emphasis has been uh less on uh, you know dealing with the problems at city level uh, and looking at logistics as something which can be tackled at city level traditionally logistics appears to be an area which uh, you know has to be tackled in a more uh, at, at a more high level uh, in a more high level manner and uh, the the uh, the uh, involvement or the engagement of uh, city level uh, players uh, in uh, dealing with this problem and i would even go to the extent of saying the empowerment of city level pair, players in being able to uh, deal with this uh, problem has been uh, less and i think uh, you know it is high high time that that uh, changed because the various stakeholders the various stakeholders who are actually affected by uh, the lesser development or inadequate development of city logistics are uh, people uh, in the cities uh, the the freight smart city what is a freight smart city so i think that question is central and in fact uh, uh, you know th this was a th this was a question that we were grappling with when we were trying to uh, deal with a parliament question you know on on this subject uh, that was uh, answered i think in uh, in the current uh, parliament session so uh, i mean the answer that we figured out would be that uh, a city that plans for freight flows instead of just regulating it that is something that is that is you know a, a segregating uh, uh, you know sort of definition of a freight smart city it uh, plans for freight flows instead of just regulating them and derives economic environmental and social benefits for its residents while helping the country reduce its logistics costs so i think uh, uh, although there is no formal definition but this is the closest that i could uh, arrive at bringing all the various elements together so that is what a freight smart city would be and what are the features that uh, a freight smart city should should try and develop so and and uh, you know linked with this is the question of you know who is funding whether whether it is the funding which is the key issue and and our understanding is that that uh, funding of projects at city level is something that the state governments line ministries like uh, railways roadways uh, you know ministry of uh, port shipping wherever ports are involved airports uh, for civil aviation so those investments are already going in so where is the problem the problem is in channelizing these investments in accordance with a pre conceived pre developed plan and 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 therefore a freight smart city the first element uh, you know uh, that that it needs to have uh, is to figure out a city logistics plan for itself you know uh, Uh, the infrastructure development should take place in accordance with that uh, plan now a plan like this would require multiple stakeholders to to come together and decide their priorities to uh, you know like a like somebody mentioned um, you know it should be like a joint venture of various stakeholders coming together and pulling uh, you know having an adequate opportunity of pulling their way Uh, the the decision making should be collaborative and you know bringing together those uh, various stakeholders and who are these stakeholders this would include the city residents the shippers uh, the logistic service providers the end users uh, let us say the construction companies or you know wherever the uh, material that is coming into the city or going through the city is going to be put to end use and of course the government uh, agencies uh, city uh, management agencies so 
so so once you create an institutional framework which has all of these elements uh, in place and there are fantastic examples uh, of uh, such institutional mechanisms uh, delivering fantastically uh, i think uh, you know i have had discussions with gordon on uh, the uh, you know the uh, london uh, freight uh, uh, collaboration um, uh, and, and i think a similar living lab uh, type of uh, agency is available in rotterdam and i think there are several examples all around the world so so that particular agency coming together that particular institutional mechanism coming together would be the first step because once it is there then this will decide the priorities for the for the city the, the priorities will be decided on the basis of what infrastructure is available what freight flows are currently happening what the city aspires in terms of you know in terms of economic development what type of industries are going to be set up what type of uh, you know flows will take place in future whether the works already in place are adequate to take care of those needs and if not then what are the additional works that would be required so that is in terms of infrastructure but also in terms of processes systems of approval uh, it systems uh, you know the data that is needed in order to take these decisions so so uh, so that needs to be done and also this the, the decisions about not only the monitoring of the works which are going on but also whenever new works are getting planned the prioritization the city will be able to through this institutional mechanism come to some sort of a conclusion as to whether it requires a bridge or a flyover at location a or a uh, you know a, 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 a another work at some other location so that is that is what this institutional mechanism should be able to do um now what is the status of all of this right now so i think that is an important uh, question uh, for us to consider i think right now we are in the stage of stakeholder consultation and uh, you know deciding as to what are the what is the right step forward and i as i told you the the uh, meeting on the 2nd uh, july was a considerable way forward uh, also let me tell you that uh, the individual states uh, you know they have they have been taking uh, a number of steps uh, at their own behest uh, of course in collaboration the the whole process had started uh, on the uh, during the meeting with all the states uh the first national conference with the states in the month of january where uh, city logistics was one of the uh, uh, breakout sessions and at least nine states participated uh, quite closely in that session and uh, we were able to uh, you know create a four or five point action agenda including the quick wins that uh, the cities could take up so so that is where the process had started and uh, you know i am happy to report that individual uh, states have expressed substantial uh, interest and have also taken some of the very key uh, steps that we had uh, discussed in the first conference and uh, if i can just uh, mention some of those uh, so panaji goa uh, has uh, you know has developed strategies for urban sustainable freight it has done stakeholder analysis and a working group has been put in place and it has a self uh, monitoring tool to calculate urban freight emissions in the city um, it has created a baseline report in this direction the kochi metropolitan transport authority kmda has formed urban freight committee to integrate plan and regulate urban freight as a part of urban mobility and development gujarat has taken several steps gujarat uh, uh, infrastructure development board has constituted city logistics coordination committees across municipal corporations of eight cities namely Uh, Ahmedabad, Surat, Vadodara, Rajkot, Bhavnagar, Jamnagar, Gandhi Nagar, and Junagar. So that is uh, that is about Gujarat. Telangana uh, has uh, developed actually developed a freight plan which it has integrated with its uh, city mobility plan. So that uh, in Hyderabad, uh, Unified Metropolitan Authority is a substantial way forward. And Himachal Pradesh, uh, the uh, Shimla Municipal Corporation has taken several measures on urban freight. Uh, you know and these are actually uh, not really in terms of the original ones but you know steps like shifting of uh, uh, the transport nagar building of new anaj mandi widening of roads so as i just uh, you know mentioned that that states are already moving ahead in the broad direction that we have uh, envisaged and uh, and the uh, and this is very encouraging for all of us uh, you know over here 
in the meeting that i was referring to on 2nd july you know two important uh, uh, milestones were achieved uh, one one was that a handbook containing 14 uh, key measures which the states can uh, take up in order to progress in the direction of uh, better uh, management of city logistics so that handbook which has been compiled uh, with uh, you know the cooperation of rocky uh, mountain uh, uh, institute um, as well as uh, giz and uh, the ministry of housing and urban affairs so that handbook was released by the uh, honorable uh, minister uh, shri puri and uh, a website which we intend to you know develop further and uh, create as a as a as a key instrument for uh, dissemination of information for uh, identifying uh, the good work done by individual states so that website has also been released and uh, Uh, by the honorable minister so these were the two steps taken coming to what is it that we now need to do and and i think this was discussed at length in that uh, in that particular meeting as well i'm sorry uh, am i visible and audible all right so so uh, coming to the next steps the next steps uh, is to uh, marry the interested cities and we have received uh, you know interest from the cities of uh, bangalore shimla panaji um, these three cities have already written uh, you know written to us and told us that they are interested in joining this uh, this uh, movement forward uh, we have to marry the institutions that that are available with us which have participated with us and i think uh, professor sanjay gupta in that particular consultative meeting Uh, gave an excellent presentation of what are the you know specialized capabilities of individual uh, institutions so these institutions have to be connected and uh, uh, you know with the with the institutions that are available uh, according to you know convenience of everyone and uh, the next step would be to you know uh, support them to develop city logistics plans and i think a, a good way would be to uh, perhaps uh, uh, you know at least uh, from our own side you know try and develop the templates of city logistics uh, plans if we can uh, you know within the institutions uh, templates of city logistics plans uh, which would kind of be uh, tweaked by the individual cities to to suit to their specific requirements i mean there would be very small cities there would be something of a medium nature and then there would be big metropolises like uh, delhi and so on so i think the uh, broadly the spectrum comprises of five or six uh, or perhaps uh, more um you know types of uh, city logistic plans that need to be developed i think the problems can be classified and i think with that uh, you know the ball should set rolling uh, the fact that uh, you know this is uh, this seminar is happening is is uh, testimony to the fact that uh, that uh, the subject has uh, you know uh, generated interest uh, and uh, i am sure that uh, with the contribution of uh, all the various stakeholders who believe in this uh the uh, you know the the importance of development of freight smart cities uh, you know we can we can uh, take several strides forward so i'll stop here and uh, you know uh, we can we can you know hear from the remaining panelists please thank you thank you uh, thank you sir thank you uh, for a very informative us uh, uh keynote uh, session uh and highlighting the importance of having freight smart cities and uh, uh now we will start with the technical session uh over to you gordon and abhi thanks okay thank you so i want to show my presentation okay i assume everybody can hear me great okay so i'm going to change gear slightly uh, i want to talk a little bit about back to basics um it, it's really really fascinating hearing all the great work that's being done by the logistics division uh, and that uh, vikash ji has uh, really really uh, grasped that agenda very effectively but anyway i'm going to take a step back and uh, try and try and inject a little bit of humor in here so uh, 
this is a question I like to ask my panels, uh, to ask my uh, audiences, and it works rather better when we're in an auditorium, but uh, often I say, well, who's used freight today? Because this is one of the things that people think that freight is something that happens to other people somewhere else. But actually, if you've been involved in any of these things, if you've had your breakfast, if you've turned on the lights, if you've driven a car, you have engaged with freight from the moment you woke up, indeed, probably while you were still sleeping. Freight is everywhere. Freight is everything that's going on around us. Uh, and sometimes it's useful to, to uh, re remind ourselves of that. So uh, I'll start off with a, a fable that some of you will be aware of uh, about the blind men and the elephant. Uh, and any of you who are parents will probably know who this elephant is. This is Elmer. It was a great favourite of my children when they were younger. Uh, anyway, uh, so I'll come back to, to why Elmer is important in a minute. The blind men and the elephant, this is a parable that I'm sure lots of you have heard. So a group of blind men find themselves in a room with an elephant and without the benefit of sight, they are all touching. And then one man touches the trunk and says, this is clearly a snake. Another man touches the leg and says, no, no, this is definitely a tree. Another takes the tail and said, this is a, this is a rope. And another has his hands on the side of the elephant and said, no, no, this is a solid wall. And the, 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 the meaning of this is, is really saying, it's very difficult sometimes to understand what the big picture is that we're talking about when we are only seeing one part of the, part of the puzzle. I think it would also just be very quickly useful to talk about some of our definitions. Sometimes we talk about logistics and sometimes we talk about freight, sometimes we talk about supply chains and they're not quite the same thing. So I think it would be helpful. So logistics in my mind is the whole system. So it's the building and operation of a network of nodes and links to optimize and optimize is an important word here, the distribution of goods and services. So effectively it's the movement of everything other than people and the movement and handling. And freight itself is much more about the movement. So if we're talking about warehousing, for example, and storage, I would describe that as part of the logistics agenda, but not necessarily part of the freight agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we talk about supply chains. So supply chains can be long, they can be short. If I buy uh, fruit from my neighbor who has an apple, tr uh, an orchard in his garden, that's a very short supply chain. If I buy a new iPhone with components that have been sourced globally, then these are very, very complex and sophisticated chains. When I talk about nodes, what do I mean by nodes? That can be factories, it can be mines, it can be fields. Uh, because Gio also mentioned stations, ports, airports, there's a huge network of warehousing and warehousing is a very, very important area for us, uh, particularly when you talk about do you mean grade A warehousing? Do you mean uh, go downs? And then, of course, you have thousands, well, literally millions, 12 million Kiranas in India uh, and the, all of the end users, and then the links that join them all together. So you can imagine you very quickly build quite a complex network. I mentioned optimization. So the question is well, optimizing what for whom? There's always a balance about cost against speed. So you can send something by air, very expensive, very high carbon footprint, but very quick. Or you can send something by ship. And as long as your ship isn't the, uh, the evergreen going through the Suez Canal, you'll be fine. It'll get there eventually, but uh, much, much lower carbon footprint. So that's always a balance. Then you have the questions about reliability, quality, safety, uh, and emissions. So emissions is a very big issue. But the question is always, are we more interested in growing the economy or in reducing emissions or finding that magic path where both of those can be tackled? And we mentioned noise and congestion. Uh, that's not such an issue out on the highway, perhaps, but in the urban areas, in the cities, those are very important things. Something that I'm quite passionate about is this balance between small businesses and big players. We hear a lot about the need to create bigger players in the market, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's in transport. But one of the things that I've seen in the time that I've been in India is that it's very much characterized by the small operator, the small family businesses. And we need to be careful that we don't lose sight of that. But we are at a special time when digitalization offers, offers the opportunity to um, 
create cooperation and coordination between those small players rather than assuming that they must all be subsumed into one larger organization and if you're talking about uh, the family and about family control of business cooperation and digitalization is a much more attractive way forward so you very quickly can build up a matrix so you see on the on the left hand side all the kind of things that you need to think about who are the people the training the recruitment the development infrastructure vehicles you can see all of those things and just taking the broad headings factories fields roads rail straight away you have 63 policy areas there i could create a matrix that had 63 million little boxes in it and each of those somehow the national logistics policy is trying to create uh, some kind of uh, stable uh, progressive platform to address all of these things but what you'll see is that the individual measures very much fit into these, these boxes one at a time and there is a, a huge task ahead of us to try and tackle that so is this a simple business well clearly not there are millions of product categories millions of different user choices i've talked about some of those other environmental factors in the complexity and in cities Nowhere is thing, are things more complex than in the city where you have millions of people trying to interact with one another. So fortunately, we have our three presenters. We're going to be hearing from uh, Professor Gupta, from Ms. Uh, Ayush, and also from uh, Dr. Ling. Uh, they're going to partly elaborate on the complexity of this and also be offering us some ideas about the way forward. So as you move forward, you will be tackling some of these individual project areas and you will eventually be building your own elephant. So I, uh, I commend the, the, uh, the next three speakers to you, building what uh, Vikash Ji has already said, and I look forward to moderating your questions later. Thank you. Thank you for the context setting. Uh, I think it helps to understand you know those basic differences that we struggle with and uh, eventually trying to build that elephant. Uh, we now have a few poll questions that we would like to uh, share and get the audience's reaction. Uh, so may I request if the first question can be shared? I'm not sure if the question is coming on the screen. Just a second. Yes. Okay. I hope the question is visible to all the audience members. So our first question is that, according to you, what is the most critical problem that is uh, created by freight movement in our cities? And I request you to select one of the most pressing issues that you feel uh, freight causes in your cities. So we we'll wait for a few minutes, a few seconds, sorry, um, till we get the answers. Okay, so I think uh, congestion has taken the lead, and I think this is one of the biggest problems that uh, you know people face due to freight in the city. And uh, coming next, actually not far away, is the air quality problem, the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, and also the uh, you know causing of accidents and fatalities in the city. They're almost coming second there. And lastly, we have parking problems in major roads, but that did not get too much better. But I agree, actually, as, as Gordon shared and as uh, Vikasa shared in his previous presentation that, you know, these are the few issues that we face the most when we talk about freight in our cities. Uh, moving on to the next question. So 
so uh, this is uh, this is, I think, a very recent phenomena that happened largely that we observed due to the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. But do you think or do you feel that there was an increase in uh, the freight trips as people were ordering more goods online, um, as they were asking, as the trips that would have ideally been made by walking to your local store for groceries were now being delivered to you? And so you feel there was an increase in the freight trips in our cities. Uh, we'll wait for a few seconds till we get all the answers. Yes, I think undoubtedly, yes. And uh, as we go forward in our, uh, as you know, as our panelists speak, I, I do believe that uh, you know, this, this situation will be highlighted that how maybe before uh, March 2020, we would have not thought of this as such an issue, but due to the onset of the virus, there has been an increase in the e-commerce business and there has been a huge increase in our uh, freight trips within the city. Uh, moving on to the third and the last question for the poll. Ah, yes. So the third question is that who all do you feel are the relevant stakeholders when it will come to preparing and executing the freight management strategy in in your city? And you know you can choose multiple options in this scenario. You don't have to just choose one. And uh, let's see what the answers look like. And I believe we have our answers. There have been various options that were chosen, but yes, definitely the urban local body and the development authority has taken the lead. But in my opinion, and as you know, as we were setting the context, that actually this is such a, a multi-stakeholder uh, area of work that there there is a need for both the public sector stakeholders, so the local bodies, the development authorities, transport department, traffic police. And we also have to you know, go hand in hand with our private sector players. So the local uh, chamber of commerce and industries, the freight forwarders, transport association, all will play a very crucial, a very important role uh, when it will come to you know, preparing a freight management uh, plan and when it will come to executing some of these measures in our cities. So with this, we come towards the end of our poll session. And uh, may I now request uh, Gordon to please introduce our panelists and then we can begin with the technical session. Thank you, Avni, thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we have three uh, esteemed speakers to talk to us this morning. The first is Professor Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is Professor of Transport Planning at SPA Delhi. He's been working in this area for more than 30 years. Then we will be hearing from uh, Ms. Saraj Ayush, who is a senior transport specialist from the World Bank. Uh, Saraj has been uh, working uh, not only in the private sector, but also within the Ministry of Railways. So she has a very broad experience, which we, she's bringing to us today. And then the third presentation will be from uh, Xuan Ling, who is one of my colleagues from uh, the GIZ in China, where he is a senior advisor to the Center, the Corporation on Low Carbon Transport, and also knows a great deal about the urban logistics experience in China. So uh, I would then like to ask Dr. Gupta if he would like to begin his presentation. Thank you. Uh Sir, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, will you be sharing these slides uh, and giving me the right? or? Uh, sir, I just give you the right. And your screen is on. You're sharing your screen. Yeah.
How much time we have, Fabni, for presentation? So we have about 10 minutes. Okay, then I'll probably have to skip few slides. Uh, is it coming through? Yes, sir, you can start your presentation. I'm not able to see. Uh, 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 yes. Yeah, uh, is it visible to all? Yeah, yes. Yes. just a minute. I'll put on the full screen. Uh, there is a full screen coming. Yeah, is it okay now, all of you? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, Yeah, so uh, I would probably be. Uh, I mean, I I hope I am audible. Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Okay. You Thank you. Thank you. So I probably will be uh, since probably the time is only ten minutes. Probably I would I would just try to kind of highlight. Uh, it, it goes without saying that urban freight is a very very major contributor to city's economy. It accounts for ten to fifteen percent of total vehicle equivalent kilometers. In urban areas, uh, two to five percent of employed urban workforce and three to five percent of urban land use. This is as per a UN Habitat 2013 report. And further, also in a typical in a metropolitan area of developing country, nearly about 40 to 50 percent of traffic is coming in. Almost 20 to 25 percent is going out, and uh, uh, well, well, the balance 25 to 40. Uh, depending upon city size and its, its its characteristics is actually consumed within the city. So urban freight has to be planned uh, in a very proper manner to ensure that city uh, prosperity uh, is maintained. Now, uh, if, uh, if you look up into the uh, goods movement pattern in Indian cities, it goes without saying that, well, uh, the, 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 the total traffic, freight traffic tends to kind of increase with increasing city size uh, not not much of work has been done incidentally in, in india on 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 mapping these traffic patterns in all its dimension most of the time we do uh, roadside outer cordon survey for uh, freight traffic which only gives me the regional movement very few cities are 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 there which actually are talking about urban freight or the movement which is within the city and this probably was one of such city uh, carried out in way back in 94 by CRRI, but it nevertheless the trend shows that well, if you go up the the city size, go up the ladder in terms of size, the freight intensities is bound to increase. So so uh, we we kind of have to be proactive in planning and anticipate such kind of movement in advance. Uh, one of the emerging trends which is now coming, and especially in cities like Delhi, big cities, Bangalore, you have this tendency of logistic sprawl happening. So you have these, uh, which is nothing but the concentration of uh, freight-related infrastructure on the periphery uh, of the of the city or the peri-urban areas, and uh, obviously this has an implication in terms of increased travel time because your distribution delivery times go up, your reliability actually uh, becomes questionable because of the network issues. So this is one of the very very important phenomena which also needs to be addressed. Uh, while planning for freight infrastructure in, in cities, master plans and mobility plans. You, this is one example I'm showing on a slide where we did a study for a logistics sprawl in a wholesale timber market in Delhi. And we found that, well, you were, you were almost moving about 104 meters. You know, it has sprawled, estimated 104 meters every year outwards. Now, obviously, if it moves at this pace every year, you're bound to have implications on the delivery uh, because all your retailers or big stockists are actually all in the city, whereas the wholesale markets are getting pushed out. Uh, interesting uh, thing, I think uh, somebody said online deliveries. Well, this is the this is the trend uh, which is taking up and which is which is going to increase in by uh, leaps and bounds in coming years. Uh, we have seen in uh, the e-commerce sector in India is anticipated to grow at 27% CAGR uh, between the period 2019 to 24, as per an estimate. 
and some 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 study which we did at our institute regarding the e-commerce sector we found that flipkart one of the major major player uh, uh, before that uh, estimated about 2.7 million uh, you know uh, online deliveries are made in delhi every day which is 27 lakhs and, and it's a huge number and one can imagine the logistic and the urban freight uh, the, the the implications on the transport network uh, flipkart one of the lead lead uh, suppliers along with amazon uh, almost uh, delivers 6.6 .6 lakh uh, kind of units so this is the kind of uh, you know uh, i am just giving a very small example and they have something like 357 delivery hubs from where all the freight is actually moving and being delivered within the city i'm just trying to highlight that urban freight is not simply o to d movement it has a lot of implications in terms of linked trips as we all know and one of the very very important and probably unnoticed element in urban freight logistics is the e-commerce uh, which is which is which is which will have to be addressed uh, by all the cities uh, since we we are beginning to show a very high dependence or such kind of systems this is just to show a snapshot of how the uh, flipkart supply chain in delhi really is happening you have a national warehouse uh, national regional level warehouse from where the deliveries come and they, they they come to something which is called a city fulfillment center uh, which is a mother hub or a sortation center uh, close to the airport in most of the cases and from there then you move to what is called the del various delivery hubs located in different parts of the city uh, one of the one of the one of the location being okla uh, in delhi south delhi and a uh, lot of lot of so so you have truck load moving happening to okla and from there then we all know how the deliveries actually start taking uh, you know, by delivery boys on two wheelers and 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 small auto rickshaws, and they have a, a, a linked uh, schedule of of uh, drop uh, deliveries in, in drop zones in different uh, residential neighborhoods. So this is how the whole whole mechanism is happening, and this seemed to be at the moment not being addressed at all in our urban freight uh, analysis. It's all market driven uh, uh, efforts. So this is one issue which which probably will have to be addressed as to how they probably uh, need to be kind of addressed because they will have a lot of implications in terms of our transport dependent greenhouse gas emissions. This is the pattern of freight distribution in a wholesale market, a core area. So we are talking about a city at the uh, at the regional level, and then we come to the city, and then we come to the core. And, and every city has a, got a core, a traditional core, uh, the way you have a walled city in Delhi. And this is how uh, the different kind of movement happens right from loading unloading to transfer uh, to finally leaving to the go down and then uh, you know how how different modes including the head load one can see so uh, you have a lot of these porters head load movement happening in small la uh, small lanes so to say in in chandni chowk walled city and i'm sure this would be the similar trend in ahmedabad in in old ahmedabad and other cities this is the classical traditional uh, kind of uh, uh, trend which is there in our most of our indian cities and this again is a huge problem to address because uh, and, and 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 especially how it is being managed all the markets are bursting it seems so this again is a huge problem to be addressed some estimates of quick estimates with which we did a full fledged study of wall city uh, we found a fantastic role of non motorized transport virtually in terms of total ton kilometer virtually almost 70% of your Ton kilometers within the wall cities actually being moved by rickshaws and handcarts and porters. You know that is the kind of dependence the wall city has in terms of non-motorized transport. And uh, I, I feel this is a mode I always call NMT is a neglected option of urban mobility. Nobody bothers about it. It's it's all left to uh, people uh, the people who are who are using them. It's all left to the operator to fend for themselves. And I think this is something which I'm just flagging off another issue that we need to probably take cognizance of such kind of modes because they're playing a huge, tremendous role in, in freight deliveries operations. Well, uh, the government of India has, has had freight initiatives in logistics. And when we're talking about logistics, Gordon said, we're talking about logistics, which is more macro concept. Urban freight is only an urban movement of goods. So when you talk about logistics per se, you've got a lot of, lot of effort which has been done right from Sagarmala. We have got dedicated freight corridors, a lot of port connectivity projects are there. Freight economic corridors are being planned. And then something on logistics optimization uh, programs, LEAP is there. Uh, the government of India has also started 
uh, planning for multimodal logistic hubs and logistic paths, particularly along the dedicated freight corridors. Uh, and then you have a lot of effort being done towards improving fuel efficiency, the scrappage policy, which Government of India has recently announced, largely targeting on how the freight has to be really kind of addressed in that. And then obviously the electric mobility, a very, very important emerging uh, issue of how to electrify the urban freight and obviously the 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 advan the, the so to say incentives in the fame 2 policy uh, has are, are very very explicit towards uh, enriching the the ecosystem of so to say the so called small uh, goods carriers you know by incentivizing so this is something which government of india is doing and then planning for green warehouses in addition when we talk about urban freight per se some elements of of description was there on the national urban transport policy 2006 but then for the first time i must compliment the ministry of commerce here that they have come out really taken the bull by horn so to say and they have taken the urban freight as one of the priority sector uh, in, in tandem with uh, uh, cities and, and and states how they participate the freight smart cities is one of the very very excellent initiative which uh, government of uh, india through the Ministry of Commerce is taking up. So, so things are now turning to uh, start looking up. We have been looking up into the sector. People have started realizing that, well, urban freight needs to be addressed. Now, I would like to spend some time here. What are the issues and challenges in urban freight sector? Uh, when we talk about issues, well, to me, as a planner, as a transport planner, urban planner, well, one of the very important issue is how to, how to kind of treat what is called a logistics sprawl and its impact in in, in urban areas and incidentally our master plans are completely silent because the logistics sector is totally in the private domain uh, uh, i would also put it that the master plans are insensitive to the dynamics of logistic uh, the urban freight this is something which i think a uh, time has come where this 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 whole complexity of how the goods move from uh, from manufacturing facility to the uh, finally to the consumer how the whole supply chain actually happens what are the actors need to be kind of studied in detail and once we start studying in detail we can probably anticipate the phenomenon of logistics sprawl in future uh, we need to do that the second obviously is increasing e-commerce deliveries and its management e-commerce looks to be very fine in covid obviously it has scaled up it's gone up uh, uh, you are looking into a concept which i now call it as when we talk about mobility as a service we now are coming into a, a era where we call a freight as a service you know it's something like uh, just like mass, you are now going to have freight deliveries as a service. So people want freight to be delivered at home. And when you are trying to deliver at home, uh, well, uh, the planners and decision makers cannot be just silent to what kind of challenges which are going to come. It's going to have lot of lots of delivery issues already we know in Delhi. There are certain time restrictions. Either you deliver in the morning or after 8 or 9 p.m. So the afternoon are absolutely uh, not there for fleet deliveries in most of the cases. So, but these are all ad hoc management decisions. We need to actually know that what are the requirements? Are we doing it properly? Are we planning the micro hubs properly? Uh, what kind of delivery patterns are happening? At the moment, everything is done done by these the the players themselves. I think there's something a hugely neglected area. Then obviously the neglect of non-motorized modes in freight delivery, as I just pointed out. I think we need to take a step forward. We have been, there has been efforts to modernize, for example, cycle rickshaws, Fazalka, classical example where the non-motorized, the cycle rickshaws have been modernized, make them more lighter for the operators. I think it is high time we need to kind of innovate in terms of non-motorized, non-motorized low carbon freight vehicle technology, how they can be made more simpler, more, more, more kind of useful uh, and, and more amenable to our, our, our conditions in India. I think this is something which we need to kind of look into it. So it's not only technological innovation, it also needs service planning for them, where they, where they can park their vehicles, um, what kind of financing mechanisms can be done, this whole gamut of things which one need to kind of take it. Then obviously inadequate freight handling and parking, huge, huge area. Uh, when I'm talking about freight handling areas, I'm talking about areas which are really addressing, which are really handling freight in and out for example our, our our wholesale markets our vegetable mondays you know huge uh, we are talking about industrial areas which probably must be bursting at seams in some of the areas or 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 we are talking about parking 
hardly any parking facilities hardly any dedicated parking facilities are there and i'm sure uh, people are aware in delhi and other cities as well i have seen how trucks get parked in posh residential areas i mean you know areas which are passive they just park and and probably traffic police is unable to do anything because there is no the place for them to park now this is something which we need to start looking into it what kind of parking management will have to be planned for what kind of dedicated freight parking facility will have to be planned for inadequate emphasis on urban freight in city master plans and city mobility plans exactly now this is the crux of the matter we hardly are there hardly any let's put it hardly you can count on your fingertips master plans which probably have uh, give weightage and importance to freight in a to, in, in a very very comprehensive manner just showing one truck terminal here and one truck terminal here doesn't really make a, a logistic plan we need to kind of understand the whole entire logistics what are the ramifications where such facilities need to come as as uh, as uh, uh, the uh, uh, our mr vikas from uh, ministry was just referring to have some of the facilities need to be upgraded i think very important so th there is virtually no assessment uh, city mobility plans again as i said very few cmps uh, prepared till date have really a dedicated freight analysis and a freight proposal so this is something which is and then inadequate capacity of trained urban freight specialist obviously uh, a time has come and i'm sure this ministry of commerce initiative of giving a push to urban freight sector slowly will also then uh, kind of uh, see how urban freight can be specialized can be offered in academia can be offered in uh, can be offered as a training module to train a lot of urban local body officials and specialists until you do that probably things are not going to be are not going to look up and finally absence of explicit research on urban freight in diverse areas i think some of the areas are very important urban freight activity database we hardly have database on urban freight there is no uh, let's put it a repository or a centralized place where urban freight data can be can be can be uploaded can be shared can be used for research very important uh, stakeholder mapping and their interactions in freight distribution you see urban freight is not just talking about vehicles it's talking about whole process how who are who are the entities who are involved in freighting who are the players who who make a decision uh, have we mapped all these people what are their roles as far as urban freight is concerned because each of their roles become important ultimately uh, in terms of delivery methods what kind of mode what kind of route when they will deliver what kind of loading pattern they will do so i think this is something very important and i think it is here we need to develop scientific modeling methods and uh, uh, processes in fact uh, urban freight modeling uh, has to now slightly move from a very very typical growth oriented approach of doing a forecast to actually looking into it uh, something which is probably uh, just supervised uh, a phd work on freight looking into agent based simulation systems how one can have agent based modeling systems through simulation to actually see how how freighting will happen in micro areas something of those so we have to slightly look up there adoption of sir, city logistic sir, measures sir, uh, please to wrap up in the next two minutes sir yes i'm just i'm just wrapping up so adoption of city logistic measures uh i'll just quickly say some of them uh, measures scientific decision making on traffic management the current traffic management processes are fairly crude there are no scientific basis for those the kind of management techniques which traffic police does they have their own thumb rules they're not based on scientific uh, methods and procedures then we need to also have carrying capacities of freight handling areas we've hardly any works or studies done we might do a lot of work on passenger terminals we hardly do on freight terminals technological innovations of modes as i just told uh, low carbon freight delivery methods can we use evs can we have micro mobility modes can we have non motorized what kind of modes what kind of fleet uh, policy needs to be there so much of research and finally its applications in smart mobility since we're talking about smart uh, freight cities we need, probably will have to actually see also how its can help so some of these issues pictorially i can just give a skip here uh, obviously uh, um, uh, city logistic practices in terms of consolidation centers logistic spaces you can have freight quality partnerships uh, delivery through cargo cycles we are already doing we are we are probably up the ladder europe is actually following us in a way uh, only through a better better cargo uh, cycles nearby delivery areas out of our delivery already are happening 
but we need to kind of do it more scientifically last mile delivery solution and then something on uh, uh, urban delivery van network a very interesting example has been already set up in jaipur where you try to optimize the run the dry run of trucks and vehicles to optimize their capacity something of that can happen so there are a host of logistic uh, measures which can probably be tested and urban freight solutions obviously i'll just take two more minutes they can be categorized into vehicle use optimization infra development demand related methods and land use planning and technology so obviously uh, you will have uh, vehicle use optimization would be trying to have management related uh, methods of nighttime deliveries infra development would have consolidation centers logistic spaces and terminals uh, land use planning would rather look into more of providing parking ring roads bypasses low emission zones and finally technological adop adoption would actually look into how technologies so use of ITS can we promote electrification of urban freight and of these obviously uh, the low hanging fruits the quick wins are the ones which are shown in red uh, black here so nighttime deliveries can be tested developing truck routes could be thought of uh, de develop developing delivery terminals for parcels could be thought of ITS and electrification I think these some of them are probably low quick wins uh, strategies uh, which probably can be thought of and then you have other strategies based on resources and time uh, from the set of strategies one can take up um, uh, which, which which would also include things like consolidation center as I told logistic facilities uh, you can also think of how a model shift should happen towards low carbon mode how parking and unloading zones need to be created so so you have host of solutions and strategies but we need to kind of look up which are the sets which probably can be taken up in the first round now and, and finally probably uh, we need to also look start looking into what is uh, what is called a, a hierarchy uh, of of logistic facilities uh, with starting at a, a urban logistic zone and then you have the urban freight distribution centers and finally you have the urban urban uh, stations uh, where where you can have in terms of size they can be small but with high density so you can have small small urban station and, and as you keep on going up the ladder in terms of uh, the 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 size you can probably have um, uh, urban freight distribution and finally you can have urban logistic zone so this this as you can see from the graphically here you you probably need to kind of develop what is called a hierarchy of logistic facilities i think the more research needs to be carried out and a kind of when we say a clp uh, a city logistic plan is supposed to be prepared i think one of the objective of that plan also should be to identify what kind of hierarchy of logistic facilities will have to be proposed for that particular city so just half a minute way forward obviously i think we need to project urban fre uh, freight as a more priority sector i i'm very happy mr vikas already sensitized this but i think still we need to push it up further we need to bring that fact that well urban freight is important for city's economy it contributes to tax it gives jobs so we need to quantify those those uh, values we need to also demonstrate utility of sustainable distribution strategy because ultimately urban freight gets notified or gets gets told in terms of how efficient a sustainable freight is that is how we will like it i think we need to test some of these quick win strategy through demonstration projects we need to assign priority to low carbon modes which is the need of the r and which probably to in my mind will also improve the image of urban freight which probably at the moment doesn't sound to be very good we always take it as a sector which is which is which is not really up the ladder we need to kind of create that image branding i think branding is the right word we need to brand urban freight uh, we need to build reliable database as i told we need to encourage urban freight partnerships between academia industry and government and finally we need to strengthen the capacity of officials and both in government and in academia for urban freight thank you Thank you so much, sir. Hi. That was a very comprehensive picture of the entire freight sector, I have to say. Uh, the issues that we're dealing with in the cities and also an array of solutions that you, you, know, you pointed towards. Uh, taking one of the issues that you mentioned in your uh, presentation, taking that forward, I would now like to invite uh, Ms. Saroj Ayush uh, to speak about the rise of e-commerce logistics and its impact in our cities. Thanks. Uh, just doing an audio check. Am I good? 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thanks, and I'll take a leaf out of uh, what Gordon was uh, sharing as to the elephant and the way we are kind of deciphering the elephant. The question is, what is this elephant? Is this elephant the congestion, the air quality, the logistics cost, the uncertainty, the quality of life, or is it something else is uh, a question that one needs to answer first. And I was surprised to see the word customer satisfaction in his uh, presentation. Is it that the, the challenge of the day that we are trying to address? So what's e-commerce actually sitting over there and doing? Uh, e-commerce is changing the entire course of supply chain management or logistics or freight transportation, each, whichever way you want to define it. Uh, the traditional methods of freight transportation, which we all studied, it was a one-to-one -one relationship and then one-to-many relationship. Uh, E-commerce is changing it completely in by adopting technology to customize delivery solutions so that currently you are delivering to a completely diffused landmass. You know, you don't know who your customers are. You It just appears 24 hours before that here is the demand that you're supposed to be addressing. And so there's a lot of uncertainty in demand modeling. So what is it impacting? It's impacting the entire methodology that the researchers and the policymakers and the people who've been struggling with this uh, activity to have take a step back and take a relook. Now here is another question which starts coming in. Is a method of stepping back and taking a relook really going to help us? Uh, my research actually tells you no, uh, because the changes in the technology is happening at such a fast pace that the evolution or the organic nature of demand, uh, which the uh, e-commerce is seeing, is changing at a much faster pace that allows you the luxury of stepping back and doing your research and looking at it. So here, what is the conflict that we are trying to address? The conflict that we're trying to address is the government's methodology of tackling the situations with regulation method. So far, the government has been uh, addressing a particular issue by coming up with a regulation and a governance structure to implement that particular re uh, regulation. And in fact, uh, compliments to the uh, uh, Division of Logistics and Ministry of Commerce that they took a different approach and started coming up with smart freight cities and a logistics policy and an action plan to implement that, which was a step away from the regulatory environment, certainly not a living organic system that one would uh, like to see. So uh, coming back to our question, so if the question is customer satisfaction, well, who is it who's kind of dealing with this customer satisfaction question? It's basically the private sector. Uh, now, we, we all know from the principles of economics that if you kind of leave the private sector, it would uh, maximize its profit making. And if the regulations do not concern or do not protect the uh, society's uh, right for good quality of life in terms of noise, congestion, traffic pollution, safety, then that would be at stake and those negative externalities would be built in into the profit maximization theory of the private sector. So here what's the government uh, redefined uh, government outlook that one is expecting that could form to deal with this particular challenge which the e-commerce or the diffused marketing strategy of private sector is going to ha offer is the intent. Uh, is first is the government uh, has the intent or is trying to address the need of the sector. The need of the sector is that I do need my toothpaste early in the morning and if I don't have one I would go jolly well ahead and order one on Amazon and expect Amazon to deliver one toothpaste to me. So that answer which a poll that you carried out was really relevant that it increases the trips and it has changed the nature of trips. Uh, so maybe I would have gone to Big Bazaar and picked up a truckload of things, but now I would order one particular toothpaste. So is the government having the intention to address this changing nature? Yes, certainly. The, uh, it was pretty uh, uh, heartening to note that uh, 
Panaji, Kochi, uh, various cities in Gujarat, which uh, Vikas sir uh, mentioned that those cities are actually coming up with a state uh, smart city, smart freight city plan, and hopefully they would be addressing this. The second related question would be the processes. Do we have a plan? or a strategy to deal with the changing nature of the city freight requirement. Uh, uh, do the cities really have a plan? And uh, should they have a static plan or a plan which is a living plan? The uh, Rotterdam uh, example, which uh, Vikas mentioned about the living lab for uh, managing the freight. Uh, is it something which can take the feedback or take the inputs from the environment and reshape the policy environment in the city is something that the uh, public sector initiatives uh, need to look at. And uh, building on that, of course, there's a big issue of implementation, you know. So you do have a plan. And since this is 100% uh, owned and operated by private sector, this particular space, so you would need the private sector to come in with their uh, problem areas, because if you don't involve them, they would find out a solution to uh, kind of overlook or bypass. Just for uh, uh, on the aside, Coca-Cola actually has a uh, in its budget or in its budgetary allotment, it has a sub item where it says parking fines, you know, so Coca-Cola would like to stop at a non delivery place and give the uh, meet the customer requirement rather than actually go to a delivery place and pee and they're happy uh, paying the uh, parking fines, which doesn't exist in India in any case. So uh, do we have an implementation plan? Are we involving the private sector to buy in there? And if at all we are involving the private sector, what's the incentive that we are offering to the private sector to get them involved? Uh, green sustainability, uh, 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 following the compliance with the regulations are all costs to private sector. So is the costs that you are expecting out of private sector to put on the table being matched with some kind of benefits that they associate with uh, putting these costs? These are the questions on the implementation side that one would have to look at. Uh, the fourth, which is another very, very uh, important uh, aspect is the capacity and the governance issues. Uh, in India, specifically in the cities in Delhi, we have seen that the governance is really lacking. Now, who is it? Is there a mismatch? Uh, do we, I mean, and research, there's abundance of research, which kind of points that the institution which has been placed for governance, the police department for uh, compliance with the RTO rules, isn't really responsible for reaching your goods to the market. So is there a mismatch between uh, the governance structure, the capacity of the people who are supposed to be implementing and whether that would be changed is uh, something that the smart freight cities and the smart planning could actually look into. And of course, uh, the last, and I'll close over here because I was wanting to share a few uh, uh, tools which were available for the public sector initiatives, but I think uh, Professor Gupta adequately covered that, so I wouldn't repeat it. But just last, the last point is the stakeholders, the public uh, sector, the private sector, and also the non-governmental institu uh, institutions which ex uh, which kind of exist in these cities. Uh, can you involve them? Could sustainability be made the primary concern? Uh, but does sustainability come under the question of uh, reducing customer satisfaction, which is the really the uh, challenge of the day? Uh, would you like to alter the customer behavior by forcing them to go to the market to buy a particular uh, item? Or would you allow the customer buying behavior to grow as it is on its own and uh, the uh, products to move to the uh, people who are consuming? Although there is no decision which is simple and all of them have their own negative impacts and positive impacts and it's all geographically uh, uh, designed and uh, I'm sure if an institution is put in place which is incapacitated to govern and take the stakeholders inputs uh, in planning the uh, smart freight cities, it would be a long way uh, that we would have achieved from wherever we are as of now. I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that address. And uh, I think you raised some very, very valid points here, ma'am. You know, just talking about this shift from the way 
the government has dealt with this regulating and restricting the sector to now be more open and uh, how do we now go ahead and plan uh, by not restricting but coexisting and co-planning together you know this whole idea of living labs uh, that i think sir has also mentioned in rotterdam that we need to experiment we need to fail and then we need to see you know what is the solution that the city and the and the private players are comfortable with and i think the second point that you raised which uh, going forward when we are going to have the trade smart cities that cities will need to you know think about is that how do you live and how you meet your sustainability targets your emission targets but that at the same time the private sector is also able to meet the customer satisfaction targets i think we have to figure out what that fine balance would be and what the solutions for that would look like so uh going forward let's see how the cities will react to that uh thank you for that i would now like to invite mr ling uh he has worked as gordon mentioned in the address that mr ling has worked extensively in china and we would love to hear of how they are you know managing and how they are dealing with the freight issue in china and what are some of the best practices that you know we can take and we can learn from and replicate maybe in india mr ling thank you very much abdi uh, may i have the uh, authorization to share my screen please Yeah, I just gave you the link. Yeah, I've received it. Um, see if you're able to uh, see my uh, presentation, please. We're not able to see your presentation yet. Yeah, I think it's a bit lagging. Um, or some um, please bear with me a second so we can uh, see it now. Yes, now we can. Yes. Uh, yeah. Was which screen you're saying the uh the presenter screen or the the powerpoint oh uh, now right now i'm seeing the the presenter screen not the powerpoint i think you have right. to share the yeah i need to reshare it uh what that uh how should i just one sec sorry for that Okay, if I fixed it, um, we're just waiting for the screen to show. Yeah. Or oh, if you could resend me the alteration, please. I'll yeah, reshare sure. it. Yeah. Sorry. Right. There we go. Mm. May I request if we can make it in the presentation mode? We are seeing the PowerPoint right now. Still no? Yes, this is good. We can see the presentation okay. now. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Abdi, and thanks for the tech support. I'm sorry for the uh, delay. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much uh, to invite me uh, for this um, uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about China's uh, best practice uh, with the focus on promotion application of new energy uh, vehicles in the urban delivery sector in, in China. Uh, as, uh, China is actually a, a leading country and also the largest testing testing field for new energy vehicles. So I'm hoping uh, through this study presentation that could give uh, a reference and also lessons learned for peer countries on the decarbonization of the freight in the uh, urban delivery sector. Uh, As Gordon has just mentioned, the uh, CLCT project, this study is actually also under the CLCT project, uh, and a bit of quick brief on the uh, CLCT. This is a, a, a implementation project uh, under bilateral cooperation uh, between the uh, Federal Ministry of Environment, Natural uh, Conservation and Nuclear Safety, BMU of Germany, and Ministry of Transport of China. 
and and quickly why are we focusing on the uh, uh, transport uh, actually China had to set a very ambitious goal uh, last year by me uh, by President Xi Jinping to uh, to announce the carbon peak uh, and carbon neutrality by 2030 and 2060 uh, respectively and in terms of the transport sector is actually ranked as a number three uh, in contributing the uh, total carbon emissions in China however this is actually the uh, largest sector, which is still showing the trend of increasing as transport usually is a uh, backbone of uh, economic growth. So uh, it's, it is now counting 11% and the 26% in the urban areas is even more. And it's showing the difficulties to, uh, to uh, achieve the uh, carbon peak by 2030, according to the uh, anticipated uh, result here. And that's also for this reason why we would like to uh, uh, start our cooperation and through the uh, political dialogue and policy study and pilot project to support the uh, low carbon transportation development in China and in the meantime to provide reference back to Germany in supporting the low carbon transfer uh, in the field. This diagram shows um, a working package for this project, which is policy dialogue, MRV, passenger mobility, and freight and logistics. And the study which I'm going to share, which is the study for electrification of urban freight in partner with TPRI, the Transport Planning and Research Institute of MOT in China. Uh, this, this figure actually showed a uh, kind of development history of NEV in China. Actually, uh, uh, China's NEV de development started from uh, 20, uh, to 2009. Uh, with the last decade, we have experienced three stage from initial rearing to rapid growth, and now it's entering a stabilization stage. And for the uh, uh, new energy logistic vehicles specifically, that's, that's generally started the, uh, from the third stage, which is 2015. If you look at some uh, general figures, uh, thanks to a bunch of supporting policies and uh, financial schemes, now China's uh, NEV market has been booming for the last decade and has been ranked as number one in the last five uh, consecutive years. And in, by the year of uh, 2019, the production and the sales both reached 1.2 million. So following this N NEV uh, uh, development, the new energy logistics vehicles, which is NELV, has also uh, increased a lot. And it's also trying to now have uh, the largest uh, NELV fleet in the world, as you can see on this pattern. And so however, we, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but we're still on slide uh, one. We have not changed the slides for us. Right, I think it's probably it's a bit slow. I'm on the slide. I'm already on the slide eight. Are you able to see? Uh, no, it's not visible for me. May I just request if the organizers are, if the slide is changing for them, because I only see the first slide, which is on the background information on the CLCT project. Uh, yeah, we are still on the same slide. Yes. Can you yeah. end the slideshow and show? Sure. Yes, thank you. Thank you. How about now? Uh, it's not changed. Or oh, otherwise, uh, I have sent a backup document to to Noshing. Are you able to share from your side? Uh, yeah, I'll present. Okay, then I will stop mine. Yes, yes, Mr. Ling. Please, sorry for this interruption. No worries, sorry for that. Did you write?
Yeah, I can see the slides. Um, next page, please. And next. Next one, please. Yeah, yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, so I, I will repeat this slide again. Um, as I mentioned, China started the uh, NUV promotion from 20, uh, 2009, and because of a lot of um, supporting policies and also financial uh, schemes that's come out since 2009, the China's NUV market has become uh, the world number one uh, in production and sales for the last five consecutive years with the uh, the total number of 1.2 million, over 1.2 million in production and sales in 2019, and that's the latest data we can, uh, status data we have received. And along with the uh, NUV uh, development, the uh, new energy logistics vehicles are also growing. And uh, China also has the largest uh, NELV, the uh, logistic vehicle fleet. And um, as you can see on the right side of the, the figure, the bar chart, however, the increasing rate has been uh, decreased since 2018 due to the phase out of purchase subsidy, one of a very important uh, pillar, uh, uh, financial uh, uh, supporting scheme pillar. However, the total uh, uh, stocks of the uh, NELV already uh, for over 400,000. Uh, next slide, please. And to the uh, infrastructure, uh, because the NUV uh, also just like uh, petrol refueling stations that you know you need to refill the petrol for the NUV to recharge it. So uh, the infrastructure also improved along with the NUV development. Uh, by uh, last year June, China owns over five uh, five thousand sixteen hundred uh, uh, five hundred sixteen thousand unit of charging piles. Uh, and the increase in speed was quite fast uh, compared to that of 2018, uh, the increase nearly a quarter. But the spatial distribution of the networks are kind of uneven. They mainly located in the well, uh, economically well-developed regions, such as Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region, the capital area, the Yangtze River Delta, and Pearl River Delta area. And there is a very uh, iconic uh, factor uh, that is the ratio of charging piles to vehicle that's also showing that uh, uh, it's decreased very fast from nearly eight to one in 2015 down to 3.5 to 2019. And in addition to uh, the, uh, the main regions for the network, China also is building a, a charging network along their expressways, uh, but it's also mainly uh, on the Eastern part of China. Uh, and of course, there are still uh, shortages only charging facilities in terms of the absolute number, the, the, the demanded uh, quantity, and also the, uh, the network distribution. As you can see, I listed here, like according to the plan uh, issued in 2015, uh, compared to the actual statistical figures that have, is far from meeting the required number. And if, um, if by 2025, according to our plan, we would like to, uh, further decrease our charging power to vehicle ratio down to one to one. Although there's a, recently there's a debate whether it is necessary to, to keep the equal numbers of charging powers in the vehicles. This is, uh, but, but just by, only by looking at the ratio, this is still a way to go. And next page, please. Uh, it's a bit frozen on my side, but I will, st I will continue anyway. Um, and then if we look at the compensation of uh, any LV in the market, the battery powered electric vehicles are, are, are dominant in the market, followed by uh, fuel cell vehicles and plug-in vehicles. And also because the nature of NEVs, they're able to, are they able to transfer their digital signals and being collected the uh, uh, the government is actually trying to uh, uh, to create a platform to monitor and optimize the operation of NUVs through uh, digital transfer transformation. As the picture on the right is showing, a national NUV monitoring and management platform. Uh, there are also several uh, local platforms dedicated for logistic industry, 
by matching the demand between shippers and freight carriers, uh, optimizing the, uh, the, the driving route, uh, the driver's compliance, and uh, uh, various other measures to increase the, the, the freight efficiency, therefore to lower the operational cost for more sustainable development for the industry. The next page, please. And for the, uh, the compensation of the uh, NEV, they are currently, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, for the uh, new energy vehicles, um, actually battery vehicles dominating. So uh, they mainly just um, mini to medium sized vans and light duty trucks. Here I need to uh, uh, emphasize that when, for this study, when we are talking about new energy vehicles, we're mainly focusing on four wheelers as uh, it is under administration and supervision of MOT in China. So uh, we are in this study, we actually excluded the three wheeler vehicles. Uh, for the main mode, the vehicle models, it's kind of uh, it's quite a controversy. Like for new energy uh, logistic vehicles and conventional vehicles, well, conventional vehicles, there are many box trucks that are uh, 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 like over 60, I mean 70 percent, and cargo vans are only 20, 25 percent. Well, it's quite opposite to the uh, new energy uh, logistic vehicles. Uh, that was actually due to the different purpose, the application scenarios. Uh, like what uh, Dr. Sanya also just mentioned just now, there's uh, vans for the, the, the freight and for the urban freight, and also partially because the uh, the technical limit due to the uh, short travel range and, and, and battery capacity. The next page, please. And in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, application scenarios, there are three main scenarios that, that mainly use the NUVs in the uh, urban delivery sector. They are urban express, urban retail supply, uh, and e-commerce self-built logistic fleet. Uh, why for that? Actually for urban express and urban retail supply, because the uh, for new new energy vehicles compared to conventional fuel vehicles, they still have a relatively shorter travel range per charge. Uh, in average of uh, 200 to 300 kilometers per charge. And due to, mainly due to that reason, so only the express or retail supply uh, that ha which has the fixed route from like point A to B with fixed uh, distribution time, product type, uh, just less complicated uh, freight travels that is more suitable uh, under current situation. And also for e-commerce, E-commerce is actually very sensitive to the time efficiency and time accuracy. But uh, in China, the, the, the this current situation is like uh, we are now building more pressure by increasing the, uh, the environmental protection regulations and, and apply road restrictions for, for diesel vehicles, for multi-purpose, for, for air pollution uh, uh, air control, and also for like GHG emission control and road congestion, et cetera. So that's why for uh, a, a large scale uh, uh, logistic uh, enterprises, they would like to build their own fleet uh, by electrifying uh, their whole fleet. Next slide, please. And in terms of uh, the business model, it's quite different from the conventional vehicles. I think this is going to be interesting, where usually the operators owns, they purchase and owns the vehicle. Now, uh, when it's down to the new energy, many battery powered uh, logistic vehicles, only those large scale companies, they still uh, have the strong, the, the, the finance uh, power or capacity to acquire their own uh, vehicles to, for their own fleet. But in China, most of cases, uh, the, uh, the freight operators would like to rent the, the new energy logistic vehicles or electric logistic vehicles through those uh, uh, vehicle renting platforms. The reason was uh, the first is the purchasing price. Now in China, the battery powered uh, electric logistic vehicles, usually the price is doubled of a, a same size diesel vehicle. And also uh, you need to consider the after, uh, the after sale market maintenance and other service, uh, et cetera. Uh, so people like operators, most operators, like 90%, they, they would like to uh, go through a car renting. Uh, 
And because of that, they have also developed three types of uh, three business types, such as the, the simple as vehicle rental service only, and renting vehicle and plus driver service. And another new type, which is a vehicle sharing, very similar to the uh, free floating uh, passenger ve uh, vehicle sharing mode, but it's actually heavily relying on the, the digital techniques uh, and also um, uh, the IoT to, to, to ensure that you're able to check and deploy those vehicles on time. Next slide, please. And in the study, we have first analyzed the, uh, the key stakeholders for the industry. We have categorized those key stakeholders into three groups, their government department, including national and local government, the market players, uh, that's the all like all the enterprises along the supply chain from production, sales, operation, maintenance, and other stakeholders like universities, think tanks, research institutions, industrial associations, etc. Next slide, please. Now, as you can see in the table, we have categorized and, and qualified uh, their degree of support and willingness of participation uh, for promotion of any LV in the urban delivery sector. As you can see here, like for the government department, uh, as the NEV, NEV development is actually China's national development strategy, so national government spares no effort to support, to actively support the development. While for local governments, in general, they're also supporting the national strategy, but due to the different economic development status, the taxation levels, the local limitations for their natural resource, et cetera, if they're, they're, the weather is too cold, for example. So uh, the, the local depart, different local department of a different city, their attitude may vary. Uh, but when down to the uh, market players, production and sales enterprises, by producing and selling NEVs, they are able to receive uh, uh, financial support and other supporting encouraging policy from government. So they are quite proactive uh, in, the, in the market. While when it's down to the uh, uh, operational uh, end, to the user end or the uh, freight carriers, uh, they're mainly because the purchasing price the afterward, the after sale maintenance difficulties, and most importantly, the so-called like the, the, the travel range anxiety per charge. Despite if they have ever used the NEV or not, this is always uh, the, the, the issue for them to, to acquire uh, the NEVs for their service. So that's why they are relatively more reluctant in the field. And the vehicle leasing enterprise, as I mentioned before, actually this type of business is born together with the industry. So they are quite supportive. But of course, it's, uh, the local uh, leasing companies also subject to their local policies. Some of them are very favorable. Some of them are uh, kind of uh, uh, less uh, supporting, supportive. And for the uh, infrastructure-wise, uh, the SOEs, state-owned enterprises, because they are supporting national uh, policies, so they are quite uh, proactive and supportive to the field. Uh, also, actually, it requires a large of investment and a very long period of, uh, of return. For, for investing in infrastructures. But for local private uh, enterprises, it is really subject to the uh, local policies. In some places are very, very good for their business, but some are not. Going down to the uh, other stakeholders, uh, in general speaking, China has very good environment for the NEV development recently for the last decade. You can see a lot of uh, technical exchange changes, um, like uh, workshops, conference, and research studies has been uh, carrying out uh, in this area. So they are very supporting. Well, for the industrial association, they somehow reflected uh, not only the production and sellers, but also the users of the, uh, the vehicles. So they are relatively less supportive. The next page, please. And furthermore, we, uh, in order to um, to get the first hand uh, result, the progress, uh, and also uh, the, the lessons learned uh, from the promotion of NUVs in China, we have investigated six cities around China. As you can see here, uh, I have extracted the uh, the progress to date, like the, the freight stocks number, the charging power infrastructure, and also uh, 
we have spotted actually for all those countries that have applied the right of way and also incentive policy to support the promotion application of the uh, NEV in the urban delivery sector. However, due to uh, different economic development situation and also the natural natural uh, resource, like the northern part of China usually is too cold for battery uh, vehicles. Uh, so uh, the, the outcome of the uh, uh, the result is actually quite different. They vary from like 3,000 battery electric vehicles uh, for the last five years also, and, and up to like 30,000, even 65,000 uh, vehicles to the city. Uh, but due to the, with the eye to the time, I won't go to too much details, but if you have any questions, maybe we can discuss later. Mm, let's go to the next slide, please. From our local investigation, we have spotted several challenges and problems. Some of them are different, some of them the same. I would like to emphasize some common features here. Uh, first is the uh, insufficient travel range per charge. Uh, in average, when we are talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, urban freight vehicles uh, within the city, for the uh, city delivery sector, this is usually a light duty or minivan, which the, the weight smaller than 4.5 ton. Uh, so they usually have the average of 200 to 300 kilometers per charge in China. So the uh, the travel range is um, is okay in some places, especially in summer, but in winter there's a problem. Uh, the operators would endure if they only charge one time per day, such as for lunch time, they can just stop there and charge. But if it's more than one time, that would be difficult for their business operation. And for some specific uh, scenario like the cold train service that's even worse because a lot of power being uh, sucked to the uh, refrigeration and also the price the purchasing price is now doubled of ICE in uh, inner combustion engine vehicles and also after sale, after sales market like a lack of a technician for maintenance because now it's not only mechanical work it's a lot of electrification works uh, and also the, the infrastructure and uh, most importantly, less distinguished right of way. Uh, this is very important when you encourage the operators to be able to use uh, new energy vehicles within the city to reduce the congestion uh, and also um, and mainly the emissions uh, from the vehicle fleet. So overall, that's the uh, purchase cost and operational cost that caused the problem. And next slide, please. After the uh, common features, now let's look at a bit of different characteristics. Uh, because in China, there is a, a green freight, green urban freight pilot program started from 2018, and those six cities are being investigated. They are all in the first batch or second batch of those pilot cities. Uh, this study hasn't really finalized yet, so this is only a, a kind of a stage progress re result. So I only listed five cities analysis here. As you can see, uh, like the leading cities for the first batch pilots, they are Shenzhen and Chengdu. Shenzhen is a tier one city in China. Um, it's a metropolitan city, very rich. So that's why they're able to intensify the use of vehicle by a huge subsidy and intensive schemes. Uh, together with the right of way policy. And they are also trying to foster the market development by uh, like self driven, like market driven, not only the policy driven. And it's so far approved, uh, it's quite successful as they have more than 65,000 uh, battery electric uh, uh, logistic vehicles in the city. And Chengdu is uh, a capital city of one province in southern part of China. Uh, they are not as rich as Shenzhen, so they are many actually uh, using government driving force by uh, uh, applying very comprehensive, uh, very uh, prioritized the right of way policy to uh, new energy vehicles only. So when we get the feedback from the local operators, they feel like even without any intensive um, uh, like um, supporting financial support, only through those uh, right of way that is good enough for them to uh, to be able to uh, sustain their business within the city. Uh, like in another backward city I wrote here, like in Tran, this is another capital city of a, a province in the northern part of China. The problem is the winter is too cold. So uh, as I mentioned, the 200 to 300 kilometers per charge, 
and in winter, there's uh, around 60% of that travel range. That's really a problem for them to further implement, uh, to further uh, promote uh, the NEVs. Uh, and the second batch, like uh, another two cities, Foshan. Foshan in China is renowned as a hydrogen capital city in China, where they are trying, they are making a lot of effort to promote hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicles, which their focus started from passenger vehicles and recently moving to freight vehicles. But again, right of way is their main measures to the all NEVs. Uh, Zhengzhou is also a capital city of one province in the central part of China. They also have put a lot of money a good money to uh, subsidize the vehicle purchase operation as well as the charging infrastructure operation, but lack of right of way. So as a result, still the NELV development is a little bit lagging over there. Next slide, please. Okay, can we, uh, one more minute, please, Xuan? Yeah, sure, this is last slide. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, and this is only a, a preliminary uh, a result. Uh, I'd like to share with uh, with you the uh, the projection uh, of the vehicle NEVs in the market. Uh, 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 based based on the uh, current uh, policy trend and also our goal to meet the carbon peak in 2030, we actually predicted uh, the incremental for incremental vehicles, uh, logistic vehicles. That will be 30 to 40 percent share of NEVs in the, uh, to the market, and also to the uh, uh, not the urban delivery, but I mean the uh, the, the replacement uh, of the vehicles. There will be 15 to 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 20 percent of vehicles with new energy vehicles. And in terms of the application scenarios, uh, technically, uh, most of the cases, most application cases inside the city, that is like. Uh, battery electric vehicles is already competent for those scenarios, except for some niche uh, uh, area like a cold chain, an extremely cold weather area that can be supplemented by the uh, fuel cell vehicles. And for the policy suggestions, uh, as listed here, we suggest the policy to reduce the, the manufacturing cost, the purchasing cost, the right of way not only to the road accessibility, but also parking for loading, unloading to, to, for the, to reduce the operational cost, the, the infrastructure to improve the charging convenience, innovative business model to, in, to increase the higher efficient, freight efficient, and complete standard and complete after sales market to provide a, a better environment for after sale maintenance uh, for the industry. And that ends my uh, presentation, thank you. That is great, Xuan. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have five minutes left for some questions. I've had a couple of questions through already. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've summarized the, the questions. I've combined a few of them. Um, so if we can kind of limit our answers to 30 seconds, if you can, a minute if you can't. Um, so first off, uh, going back to your presentation, Professor Gupta, uh, there were some questions that's been asked about parking infrastructure and whether you think that that is, uh, in, well, what does that look like? What is the solution that we're talking about? And before you answer, uh, there's been another question which has been about out of hours deliveries and the safety and the, the gender safety issues, which uh, to my mind fits in also with this question about overnight parking, where it is safe for vehicles to stop and where it's appropriate. So I wonder if you could give me a, a brief answer on that. And while you're talking, um, there was a question for Saroj about, uh, you made the point about should we let the market decide, should people be free to choose to have that one tube of toothpaste or should there be some kind of behavioural change? So perhaps Saroj, if you could be thinking about that, but first off, uh, Professor Gupta, uh, tell us a little bit more, a, a minute's worth on parking, please. <clears throat> well, uh, parking, uh, well, we need to kind of identify spaces. Obviously, uh, parking, especially in a crowded uh, market areas, probably will not come easy. So you need to kind of start looking for spaces. And I, I'm just trying to give example, uh, South Delhi uh, has identified close to about 30 plus parking lots which are exclusively meant for urban freight. Now, the point is that you will you will have to probably have dedicated parking, but obviously it will have an implication because they won't be close to the market of delivery. So they will have to be probably away 
and uh, some dry run will have to be there uh, well you can't you can't help uh, in such cases and uh, i think slowly probably parking also will probably have to be linked to how you can build in its of 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 ensuring that the freight vehicles enter in uh, they don't honestly crowd in a market area if if the its can facilitate their entry at certain point of time i think the idling will be minimized to quite a bit of extent and probably they will release a lot of spaces which probably they encroach upon uh, for on street parking so it's not an easy issue <laughs> i'm sure and maybe over time you might have dedicated uh, even even stack parking for freight vehicles these are ideas only you you might have stack parking only for freight vehicles goods carriers the way you would have multi level parking for passenger vehicles close to okay. the freight activity areas okay thank you thank you uh, so Roger, are you there to take the question about uh, behavioral change yeah i can uh, do that so uh, it easiest way would be to take an example and let's take the example of parking uh, uh, which we are talking about now uh, let's define that parking a little more uh, let's talk about the loading and loading bays that are required for a marketplace to for a shopkeeper to unload uh, and since uh, uh, we are all familiar with market structures so how do you influence the const uh, customer behavior and in this case i'm talking about people who are responsible for managing the supply chain the retail outlets as at present uh, now if there is a road and if you from the infrastructure point of view or from the public sector point of view you have not really provided for a parking bay where you can load and unload and then you have a regulation which kind of says that parking is not allowed on the road and you would be put on a parking fine uh, for putting at a place and then there is a, 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 a civil society which says that these trucks should not be allowed to park on the road because they eat away on our uh, right of way of movement of the vehicles. Now there's a conflict over here. So the point over here is that you cannot address a conflict just by symptomatic treatment of a particular challenge. You know, it has to be dealt on a comprehensive basis. So the initiatives which the public sector needs to do is to provide, guide, and then regulate that's the whole uh, structure that we were talking about and that would kind of influence the customer behavior yeah thank you okay thank you thank you um so uh, perhaps my last question um so shuan you talked about uh, the way that the regulations were being tightened so, so so there was a question that said well what can we do to offset the environmental impacts of of the growth of e-commerce and i think uh, that was asked when you were just starting your presentation and you went on to talk about uh how there the were increasingly tight regulations about fleet emissions and those sorts of things uh, do you think that's gone far enough or do you think there would be more regulations uh, how how is that going to to develop because clearly e-commerce is is only going to increase uh, what do you think what do you think is the best way forward to reduce some of these environmental impacts um yeah i think this will be a issue not only for india but also for china uh do uh during the covid 19 period actually uh, uh the e-commerce uh, business volume also be increased by folds uh, uh in china and this is also why that actually uh the government only government but also our research institutions associations has put their uh, uh, attach their attention to the urban delivery area because uh, uh, in, in, in China actually as I mentioned transport sector is the uh, ranked as the third of the emission uh, but over 50 percent actually around 70 percent of GHG, GHG emission actually come from the road road freight and more than half of them actually happening within the city that's a lot of them actually as I can experience here not only for the like uh, commodity transportation, uh, a lot of them actually come from e-commerce. And my opinion is actually uh, in China, and maybe can be a reference for the world, is actually they, they, there's no doubt for regulations and also the emission standard have been tightened or be further tightened. Uh, uh, this is also why we are trying to develop the other, like ele electrification of the fleet and the further to increase the efficiency of the freight. The electrification of the of the fleet is like you know we need to we need to reduce the uh, the the vehicle emission 
by every single unit. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, if, even if it's using electricity, as in China, the, the, the energy composition is not pure renew, renewable, and I don't think that'll be the case in over the world, uh, as we are still coal-fired power plants, you, you need to overall also increase the freight efficiency, and that also comes along with the, uh, the freight management, the warehousing, the, the all the linkage and the knots of the supply chain. And also like the, the parking, for example, as we are, we are now conducting a, a, a parking pilot in one of the city in China, uh, in the old build up area, we're also trying to figure out the way to overall to increase the, 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 the efficiency along the whole supply chain that to help. But with one special uh, condition that we only offer priority or the right of way, including the parking, the dedicated for new energy vehicles. Not not only to 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 the uh, the the the, the, the uh, conventional fuel vehicles because we think the government or the overall society needs to lead the direction the way to make it better. Great, great, thank you. Okay, uh, I, I I would love to have more opportunity, more opportunity to talk. Uh, yes, uh, Vikashi. Yes, Gordon. Uh, if I have your permission, uh, can I ask a question uh, to Mr. Of course, Ling? Sir. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, when, uh, you know, I, I uh, saw your presentation and it's uh, really exciting, you know, the extent to which uh, the, uh, you know, the Chinese cities are taking on the, uh, you know, the expansion of uh, electric vehicles. Uh, you know, my question is, you know, uh, so as you had yourself mentioned in your uh, presentation that the maximum range that it covers is 200 to 300 kilometers as against uh, the 600 to 800 kilometers that the typical IC engine vehicles are able to do. Now, uh, given that, uh, are you also doing the trunk transportation, intercity transportation through electric vehicles? And if not, you know, what kind of uh, transshipment arrangements, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Gupta spoke about the urban sprawl, which is happening uh, in respect of, you know, the freight sprawl, which is happening, the shifting of uh, the locations of, uh, you know, the markets, uh, outside the city center so is that a thing that is that was happening or is happening in china also and uh, you know how are you in the context of uh, relying more and more on evs uh, dealing with this problem yeah thank you very much for your question i think it's a very very good question uh, yes so uh, we when uh, in the presentation only talked about electric electrification of the fleet within the city this is a uh, now, uh, based on the current technical uh, situation, that is uh, viable. But when you're talking about intercity, unless it's, uh, it is within the, the city clusters, they are, they are close enough. And also, if you're able to, to, do, to, to design a dedicated uh, a green line only for electric vehicles, and then that is also possible. Otherwise, uh, for longer distance, still, like a, this is also a problem in China. And instead of uh, instead of uh, still thinking of solutions uh, on for for on road freight, now we are more like uh, looking for the intermodality shifting from the the freight from the road to the railway and uh, waterway. So this is the, the the thing actually we are doing, and of course, uh, as I also mentioned, for the the the, uh, the fuel cell, uh, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but due to this uh, is purchasing cost and the operational cost. To be honest, this is not uh, at least the, before 2030 or 2035. This is not really uh, could be a very uh, scaled up uh, uh, application scenarios. Uh, yeah. So um, what we are trying to do is like whatever that can be. Uh, used by electric vehicles for short distance uh, or, or, or lower, a smaller volume, but higher higher uh, value, that is go for on-road or otherwise uh, move it away from the road. So that's uh, what we're trying to do, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so sure, what, what, is, what about the, you know, the efficiency of uh, intermodal transfer, that, that, that part, if you could also touch upon. Shifting uh, from terms, road, you know that that uh, process which requires you know bringing it down and then you know loading into a smaller packet sizes, uh, you know for the sake of the uh, transportation inside of uh, cities. So you know how have you thought of some uh, innovative methods for improving the efficiency of that part? Because that I think determines the overall uh, you know supply chain efficiency and without compromising on which 
we must uh, improve the uh, you know city life yeah this is uh this is actually what we are trying to do and we wanted to do for 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 our next um for for the for our next round of uh cell city project this is also a common problem in china because uh now more than 70 percent of the freight actually in china are on road our infrastructures our warehousing actually built up on this uh, road freight this is a very big problem here and we are also lack of standardization some technical solutions on the transshipment at the depot uh, when you're trying to transfer it, but this is the this is the trend, the direction. Uh, in the short term, of course, there will be some pain, but in the long term, if we don't do it now, we will never achieve the carbon goal. In general speaking, very true, very true. And that's clearly a debate that we could we can carry on with uh, at another time. And because you would be happy to bring Shuan into the into the discussions that we're having in the future. Okay, that's been really really helpful. I'm going to hand back very quickly to Shalini to wrap up. So Shalini, if you want to pick up from here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Uh, so uh, in today's session, I think we had very interesting set of presentations uh, followed by some very fruitful discussions. Um, some very uh, pertinent and important points on urban freight management, uh, which are uh, relevant for Indian cities have also emerged. Um, Government of India through Ministry of Commerce and Industry has taken several initiatives for bringing the focus on the logistics sector. Um, there is a focus on development of freight smart cities. Uh, there is a handbook which has been developed on city logistics and uh, a website for the uh, info information sharing and dissemination has been created. And uh, there is also uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, developing city logistics plan uh, with, with multi-stakeholder partnership. Uh, which can help uh, setting priorities uh, for the cities. Um, so uh, e one of the important things which emerged was uh, how e-commerce is changing the freight and the logistics landscape. Um, e-commerce uh, uh, impacts the vehicle kilometers since a diffused demand is being serviced. And one of the important questions which emerged was the trade-off between the uh, sustainability objective and the customer satisfaction. And hence, uh, uh, what what approach uh, should the cities take and uh, uh, go ahead? Uh, in terms of uh, learnings from China, uh, uh, introducing low carbon modes in freight and delivery, um, in creation of the charging infrastructure, um, um, uh, alternative business models. Um, now, some of these things in the Indian context, uh, uh, how do we take that forward? Uh, transitioning to green vehicles in freight. Uh, can we use the existing subsidies which are available? Uh, can there be a voluntary emission reductions program? Uh, stringent enforcement of emission standards uh, in the city center area? Um, uh, and how, how can that be? Some of these things can be taken forward. Um, freight it seems, uh, it seems that freight needs to be taken up as a priority sector and developing the uh, freight smart cities would require a multi-pronged approach. Uh, uh, we saw from today's discussions, a uh, lot of points on that. We need to build networks uh, with multiple stakeholders who are involved uh, in the freight sector. Uh, it would also call for uh, uh, strengthening of the um, existing capacities of the institutions. Um, then uh, the strategies, the local freight demand managers, management strategies that we take, uh, the strategy should manage rather than being restrictive about it. And here, what kind of measures in terms of infrastructure management, or uh, parking area management or loading area management, what can be done? Um, activity locations of the freight activity locations to minimize vehicle kilometers, empty runs. Uh, what kind of land use planning would that call for? Can ITS uh, be, uh, be uh, ITS applications uh, bring in supply chain efficiencies there? Um, uh, owing to the fragmented uh, nature of the industry uh, and also because there are a lot of private players involved in this industry, uh, freight management uh, seems to be a challenge. Uh, however, uh, uh, the key is in the planning of the city, I mean, in having the city plans, either the mobility plans as well as the city development plans, how can we bring uh, the different stakeholders on board and move ahead? And uh, probably we also need to develop some guidance on that in terms of how, what, what should the city logistics plan consist of and how should cities prepare these logistics plans? So with that, I think uh, 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 we will uh, uh, close this event. And on behalf of Center of Excellence in Urban Transport, uh, CRDF and GIZ, I would first like to 
thank Shri uh, Vikas Chaudhary ji for taking out time for this mobile log and his keynote address highlighting uh, different initiatives which have been taken by Ministry of Commerce and Industry to improve the city freight movement and India's uh, logistic performance. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the panelists for the valuable contribution to today's session, uh, Professor Sanjay Gupta, uh, Ms. Saroj Ayush, and Mr. Zuan Ling. Uh, thanks to Gordon and Navvi for uh, facilitating the panel presentation. Um, a big thanks to all the participants for their uh, uh, questions. Uh, we do understand that there were, we have not been able to answer all the questions, but we will try and revert on those queries through email. Uh, lastly, I uh, would like to acknowledge uh, the support uh, of MAWA uh, in all our activities and uh, also acknowledging uh, 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 the effort of SEPT and the GIS team for making this event a big success. Uh, we do hope that the participants found this Mobilog session useful. Uh, please do join us for the next Mobilog, which is scheduled on 6th of September uh, on gender and mobility. Noshin, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.